Um, this was really, I said, quite a profound, um, I wouldn't call it a breakthrough, but realization that if we can build a system that um, cannibalizes our own products, makes our own products redundant, then all of the resources, which are quite enormous, that are used for Falcon 9 Heavy and Dragon can be applied to one system. Um, in, in our, some of our customers are, are, are you know, conservative and they want to see the they want to see BFR fly several times before they are comfortable launching on it. So what we plan to do is to build ahead and have a stock of Falcon 9 and Dragon vehicles, so that, so that customers can be comfortable if they want to use the old the old rocket, the old spacecraft. They can do that um, because we'll have a bunch in stock. But all of our resources will then turn towards building BFR. Um, and, and we believe that we can do this with the revenue that we, with, with, rev, with the revenue we, we receive for launching satellites um, and for servicing the space station. Um, so going to the satellites portion, um, the, the, the size of, of this being a nine meter diameter vehicle is, is a huge enabler for new satellites. Uh, we can actually send something uh, that is almost nine meters in diameter uh, to orbit. Um, so for example, for, if you want to do a new Hubble, um, you could send a, a mirror that has 10 times the surface area of the current Hubble as a single unit. It doesn't have to unfold or anything. And um, or, or, or you can send a large number of small satellites. You can, you can do whatever you like. Um, you can actually also go around and, if you wanted to collect old satellites or clean up space debris, you can just use the sort of chomper over there um, and go around and collect, uh, collect satellites or collect space debris if you want. Um, so that, that, may, that may be something we have to do in the future. Um, but th that, that, that fairing would open up and retract and, and come back down. So it's, it enables launching of, of Earth satellites uh, that are significantly larger than anything we've done before, or significantly more satellites at a time than anything that's been done before. Uh, it's also intended to be able to service the, the space station. <laughs> I, I know it looks a little big relative to the space station. Um, but the, the shuttle also looked big. Um, so it, it, it'll, it'll work. <laughs> Looks a little outsized, but it'll work. Um, so it's, it'll, it'll be capable of, of um, doing what Dragon does today in terms of transporting cargo and what Dragon 2 will do in, uh, in terms of transporting crew and cargo. So it can do the space station servicing. Um, it can also go obviously much further than that, um, like for example, the moon. Um, based on the calculations we've done, uh, we can actually do lunar surface missions with no propellant production on the surface of the moon. So if we do a high elliptic uh, parking orbit uh, for, uh, for the ship and retank in a high elliptic orbit, we can go all the way to the moon and back with no local propellant production on the moon. So I think that, 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 enabled, that would enable the creation of moon base alpha or, or some sort of lunar base. Um, yeah, it's quite captivating. So the um, uh, you can also see, for example, how 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 do you transfer cargo from the cargo bay down to the ground? Is a crane. It's not very complicated. Um, and um, yeah, but, but so this will enable the creation of a lunar base. And it's, it's 2017. I mean, we should have a lunar base by now. What the hell's going on? Um, and then, of course, uh, Mars um, becoming a multi planet species. Beats the hell out of being a single planet species. 
So, um, yeah, so we'd start off by sending a mission to, to Mars, where it would be obviously just landing on rocky ground or dusty ground. Um, and it's, it's the same approach that I mentioned before, which is you send the spaceship up to orbit, you retank it or refill it until it has full tanks, um, and um, it travels to Mars, lands on Mars. Um, for Mars, you will need local propellant production. But Mars has a CO2 atmosphere and plenty of water ice. That gives you CO2 and H2O, so you've got, you can make, therefore, CH4 and O2 um, using the Sabatier process and, or some, you know, probably Sabatier process. And um, I should mention that long term, this can also be done on Earth. So sometimes I get some sort of um, criticism for why, why are you using combustion in rockets and you have electric cars? I'm like, well, there isn't some way to make an electric rocket. I wish there was. Um, but um, in the long term, you can use solar power to, to extract CO2 from the atmosphere, combine it with water, and produce uh, uh, fuel and oxygen for the rocket. So the same thing that we would do on Mars, uh, we could do on Earth uh, in the long term. Uh, but that, that's essentially what happens. Similar to, to, to the moon, you land, land on, on Mars. But the tricky thing with Mars is you, we do need to build a propellant depot uh, to uh, refill the tanks and return to Earth. Um, but because Mars has a lower gravity than Earth, you, can, you do not need a booster. So you can go all the way from the surface of Mars to the surface of Earth just using the ship. Um, albeit, you need to go for, to, to a max payload number of about 20 to 20 to 50 tons um, for the return journey to work. But it's a single stage, a single stage all the way back to Earth. Um, and I'll show you the, the, the so this is the, the true physics simulation. Um, this will last about a, a minute. Um, so you come in, you're entering very quickly, going seven and a half kilometers a second. Um, for Mars, there will be some ablation of the heat shield. So it's just like a sort of brake pad wearing away. Um, it, it is a multi-use heat shield, but unlike for Earth operations, um, it's coming in um, hot enough that you really do, you will see some wear of the heat shield. But because Mars has an atmosphere, albeit not a particularly dense one, you can remove almost all the energy uh, aerodynamically. Uh, and we've proven out supersonic retropropulsion many times with uh, with Falcon 9, so we feel very comfortable about that. Um, the, the, this is a, because it's sort of, um, you can see it's sort of a, a, a mesh system. It's not, it's not meant to be sort of particularly pretty because it's just trying to simulate the physics of it. Uh, but the, the size of the cone gives you a rough approximation for how much thrust the engines are producing. That's not a typo. <laughs> Although it is aspirational. <laughs> um, so we've, we've already started building the system. Um, the tooling uh, for the main tanks is, has been ordered. Uh, the facility is being built. We will start construction of the first ship. Um, around the second quarter of next year, so in about six to nine months, we should start building the first ship. I feel uh, fairly confident that we can complete the ship and be ready for a launch in about five years. Five years seems like a long time to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I, the the area under the curve of, of resources over that period of time should enable this time frame to be met. Um, but if not this time frame, I think pretty soon thereafter. Uh, but that's, that's, our, that's our goal, is to try to um, make the 2022 uh, Mars rendezvous. Um, um, the uh, Earth-Mars synchronization happens roughly every two years. So every two years, there's a, an opportunity for um, to, to fly to Mars. 
Uh, so then in 2024, uh, we want to try to fly four ships, uh, two of which would be crewed and two of which, two, two cargo and, and two, two crew. Um, the, the goal of, 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 the, uh, of these initial missions is to, is to find the best source of water. That's for the first mission. And then the second mission, the goal is to build the, the propellant plant. So we should, uh, with, particularly with six ships, there uh, have plenty of landed mass to construct the propellant depot, uh, which will consist of a large array of solar panels, very large array, um, and then everything necessary to mine and refine uh, water, and then draw the CO2 out of the atmosphere, uh, and then create and store uh, deep cryo CH4 and O2. Then build up the base, starting obviously with one, one ship, then multiple ships, then start building out the city, then making the city bigger, <laughs> even bigger. <laughs> and, and um, yeah, and, and, and over time, terraforming Mars and making it uh, really a nice place to be. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Give me a. But I think that's quite, quite a beautiful picture. Um, and on the, on the prior slide, it's interesting to know that on, on Mars, dawn and dusk are blue. And um, it's the sky, so the sky is blue in dawn and dusk and, and red during the day. It's the opposite of Earth. And, um, but, there's, uh, but there's something else. Um, if, you, if you build a ship that's capable of going to Mars, well, well, what if you take that same ship and go from one place to another on Earth? So we, we looked at that. And the results are quite interesting. Let's take a look at that. at 27,000 kilometers an hour, or roughly 18,000 miles an hour. This is where the propulsive landing becomes very important to be get to get it right. Most of what people consider to be long distance trips uh, would be completed in less than half an hour, uh, which is. Uh, mountain. Um, so. So, yeah, so the, the, the great thing about going to space is there's no friction. So uh, once you're out of the atmosphere, you will go, it will be smooth as silk, no turbulence, nothing. There's no weather. There's no, there's no atmosphere. And uh, you can get to, to most long-distance places, like I said, in less than half an hour. Um, 
And if we're building this thing to go to the moon and Mars, then why not go to other places on Earth as well? All right, thank you.